Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith that comes to us from Jesus and the Apostles. 2,000 years of Catholic truth. And I am super excited to be here with you today, and I know Steve is too. We are two people who are passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ and about our Catholic faith. And we have a awesome show for you today. A wonderful show on a very sad topic, but the topic of anti-Catholicism. We're going to be discussing a little booklet called a Tr The Trail of Blood. And we're going to be discussing what that means in a few minutes. But this is going to debunk a lot of the anti-Catholic myths that are out there that you're going to hear in person or online. And you're going to see that many things that people say against the Catholic Church just aren't true. They're not true at all. In fact, sometimes they're so far off, <laughs> yeah, it makes you laugh. For anyone who actually knows history, it makes you laugh out loud when you read some of these things. And, and I have a lot of LOLs in the comments, which we're going to be discussing. But today, uh, we're going to be discussing the Trail of Blood with uh, Steve Ray, who is a Baptist convert. And he had led many Catholics out of the Catholic Church at one time trying to get them saved and trying to get them into the truth. But now he himself is a Catholic and studied his way into the Catholic faith and realized that it's the true Church of Jesus Christ. He leads many pilgrimages to the Holy Land, and he's written many books, including Upon This Rock, which proves the papacy from the Bible, and Crossing the Tiber, which is con his conversion story, which I really exhort people to read. So thank you for joining us, Steve. We're very glad to have you today. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here with you. I've enjoyed our shows that we've done together in the past, and I'm looking forward to this one. And the topic, I used to be one of these guys. So <laughs> I'm kind of uh, going down memory lane. I had to kind of bone up on it, you know, because that's been 27 years since I converted. And uh, this book, uh, Trail of Blood, has not been something I've read or thought much about since other than to get a chuckle here or there. <laughs> and um, so I had to kind of bone up on it today and uh, go back and uh, re-familiarize myself with it. So I'm looking forward to sharing my past, what I used to think. Yeah, and to be honest, I did the exact same thing because I haven't read... I haven't read this book and probably, and it's only a little booklet just for our listeners. It's a tiny yep. little booklet, but yep. this thing has so many errors and we're not going to, but Steve and I could probably talk for three to four errors on all of the, I'm sorry, three to four hours on all the errors in this little booklet. It's just amazing how many problems there are on each and every page. And even scholars, pretty much every scholars debunk this. So of course, we're not going to think of it. I mean, nobody really takes it seriously except for Baptists, right? Just mostly Baptists take it seriously? I think that would be a pretty uh, fair statement. Although, and, and pretty much, I wouldn't even say Baptist, because I've got a book here, which we'll talk about a little bit later, written by a man named McGoldrick, who is a Baptist, and he calls this uh, Baptist successionism. So let's, let's clarify. The book, yeah. uh, back up a little bit, the book is called The Trail of Blood. It was written in 1931 by a man named Carroll. Only 56 pages, so people will know what we're talking about. By 1994, it had nearly 2 million copies. And if you go on the internet and look, like on Amazon or somewhere, there's multiple different editions of it now with different covers. And I have the one that you have. But there's different covers and different editions of it now. So if by 1994, there was almost 2 million copies, you know it's much more. Now, who believes this? Well, it basically is believed by the fundamentalist Baptists. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Because there's a lot of Baptists that dismiss it, and it's even an embarrassment for them. <laughs> but, but it almost looms larger than that in the sense that it has a mythical quality to it. Mm -hmm. The trail of blood, Baptist successionism. We can trace our roots, Baptist roots, all the way back to John the Baptist. And the Catholic Church didn't exist. And the we Baptists have always existed. And the myth is, is that that's a true statement. And so even like you were saying, people on chat lines and on debates online and so on, they'll refer to this book as being not that they've even read it, that it presents a unique view of history that we evangelicals can claim as our own. And so even though it may only really be studied and used by kind of the really the 
far fundamentalist Baptist types or Bible Christian types. Um, so pretty much it's just fundamentalist Baptists, really kind of extreme anti-Catholic evangelicals. I would uh, say those are the are those are the really the ones that would hold to this. Um, I think I would agree with that. Um, if you don't mind me saying so, I think just based off our comments, you know, if people say this enough, they convince other people of it, even if they're not Baptist or fundamentalist or whatever. And so I think and even if they haven't read it, exactly, most people haven't read it. So they literally just regurgitate what other people have said, Oh, yeah. the Catholic Church has killed millions of people. Oh, the Catholic Church murdered everyone who had a Bible or disagreed with them. And so you hear these things and they just get repeated, but no one's ever checked it out. And so that's what we're debunking today, isn't it? Right? I call it parroting. You teach a parrot, the parrot doesn't get a book and read it. You say to the parrot enough time, Baptist successionism, Baptist successionism. And pretty soon the parrot goes, Baptist successionism, Baptist successionism. <laughs> and if no, so you, most of these people that would use this are not scholars. In fact, even this guy, I want to find this one quote. I, I love it. Um, he said that they are primarily preachers first and historians second. In other words, these, uh, the people who, preach this, the guy who taught it first, the people who preach it and the, are mainly preachers. They're not scholars. They're not students of the Bible or of history. They're mainly preachers and they've learned this from others like parrots is what I would say. Yeah. And as we're going to say, you don't even need a historian to debunk this stuff. You don't no, even need a don't. scholar. You don't even need a fourth grader to debunk these things. And some of our listeners are probably like, wait, you wait, there's actually Baptists who believe that they go back to the time of Jesus and even before Jesus to John the Baptist. And the answer folks is yes. There are fundamentalists, not regular Baptists, fundamentalist Baptists believe they go back to the time of Jesus. And we actually, have a video on our YouTube channel about a discussion I had with a fundamentalist Baptist, and he told me that exact thing, and it confused me the first time I heard it. And I said, well, that's impossible since the Catholic Church goes back to Jesus. He's like, I'm sorry, friend, the Baptist Church goes back to Jesus. I said, can you name for me three Baptists in the first 300 years of the church? And he's like, well, uh, uh, well, no, not off the top of my head. I was like, can you name one Baptist in the first 500 years of the church? Well, no, uh, actually, I can't. I can't. You no, know, but what they do is that they make a, un a, a very unusual claim that the early church were proto-Protestants in right. a sense, that they were the true church. Just Let's get a, just an overview of what they think of history. And I used to hold to this view of history. Although I had, there's two different permutations of it, two different ways it expresses itself. The There's guys like the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and most Protestants who believe that the church started out right. The apostles got out, they came out of the chutes running, and they got things right. And Jimmy Swaggart, I just did a talk uh, last week on, is the Mass really a sacrifice? And he goes on to say that these ideas of the Mass and the, the magical aspects and the sacrificial came in in the third century and later, they, these unfortunate things. So the early Christians were pure and pristine proto-Protestants is what they were. They wouldn't have called themselves maybe Baptist or Protestants, but they were that. Going around with their sandals and their robes, true followers of Jesus, faith alone, Bible alone, uh, this kind of thing. No Mary, no Eucharist, no um, priests, all this stuff is that comes later. So they're pristine Protestants and they're come out of the gates, but over it didn't take long for it to get corrupted because when, especially when Christianity became legalized, all of the priests in the temples of Zeus and Aphrodite and Apollo lost their jobs and they all came into the Catholic church and they brought their priesthood and all these pagan ideas. So the real Christians now were kicked out in a sense and they went underground. Now, here's where it changes. Many just believe that the church, that the, that it lost its way and that somehow Martin Luther brought it all back. The Seventh-day Adventists believe that. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. The Mormons believe that. Even Islam believes that. So these guys, this guy's closer to Islam and the Seventh-day Adventists and the Mormons than he is to us as real Christians today. 
Now, th what these guys do, though, is the different permutation. And I just thought of this today. It was kind of interesting. They don't believe that things just got corrupted and then reformed later. They believe that real Christians were always there, but they were underground. And they were there called Baptists. And the basic Baptist teaching they have today was always taught from John the Baptist and Jesus and the original apostles. And it had to go underground real fast because there was a great apostasy. And this apostasy hit the church in the very first centuries and it got corrupted and the false teachers were there and so on. Now, this is what this book, Ellen White from the Seventh-day Adventist. She teaches that, the great controversy, that yep. there is a... A destruction of the of the religion and it comes back she she restores it with the seventh day adventists you've got the others now here's a great book that everybody should have in their library if this is of interest to them it's written by a friend of mine named rod bennett and it says the apostasy that wasn't and have you seen this book i haven't actually it looks no, it's good. excellent. Look, it's really a thick book. And the subtitle is The Extraordinary Story of the Unbreakable Early Church. What he does is we're just going to touch on some of these things, but he shows that the doctrines that are taught by the Catholic Church today were always taught. The early Christians were thoroughly Catholic in every way. There were no Baptists at the Council of Nicaea. Let's put it that way. I also have a blog called were there Baptists at the Council of Nicaea? And it's kind of funny. We open up the Council of Nicaea and say, well, Brother Bob, how are you today, Pastor Bob? And they go on with all this Baptist terminal. And it is so comical to even think of the bishops at the Council of Nicaea talking like these Baptists do. But this book right here shows that there was no apostasy in the early church where it disappeared and altogether until the Reformation or where the true believers went underground and they finally came up with the Baptists. So th th that's the whole idea. Is real Christianity started out good, went underground or disappeared, and it all had to be recreated or brought back to the surface by reformers or God's prophets. And then later, depending on what group you follow, you can pick the date of when you actually came back to the surface again. And uh, just for our listeners, that's kind of the theory of this trail of blood is that Christ's true church um, became corrupted. Well, Christ's true church, it continues in the Baptist church, but what people think is his true church actually became corrupted around 300, 313 AD with the rise of Constantine. And he kind of blended, as Steve just said, uh, paganism with Christianity, and it kind of become a, like a hybrid of what was, and now we know today as the Catholic church. So it's kind of kind of Christian, kind of pagan, but over the years it became more and more pagan. And when Constantine came to power, they merged the church and the state, supposedly. And so the church really had this authority and anybody who disagreed with them, they began to kill. And they got more and more fierce over the years. And all along, you have these little Baptist groups who continually exist, who are holding the light of Christ, the true faith, and the Catholic Church is, it's like the Da Vinci Code or something. It's like a movie. They're just trying to wipe them off the face of the earth and kill them all. It's like a bloody history. Hence the trail of blood where the Catholic Church is killing all these different groups, right. these true Christians down through the centuries. Right. That's exactly right. And Constantine came along and when he legalized Christianity, you see the first three centuries, but even these guys won't go that far because they see already in the third century and even in the second century, and we'll talk about it, the real presence of the Eucharist was clearly taught by even the followers of the disciples of the originals. So they have to deal with that. They also don't have a Bible before the fourth century. And even these guys, uh, Trail of Blood will admit that, which is a huge problem for them, but we'll save that for a little later in the show. But when Constantine legalized Christianity in 313, the persecuted Christians, um, it now became much easier to be Christian. And when Christianity not only was legalized, but became the religion of the empire, then all those other people came rushing into the church to become members of it, and it lost its purity. And to a degree, that's true. When, this, when the church opened up to everybody and there was no longer the persecution, it became much less devout than it was before. People joined it for business purposes or for networking and so on. And, and we have to admit that that's true, but it never taught, it never lost its doctrinal purity or the tra trajectory that it had been set off by Jesus and the apostles. It never lost that. It never had an apostasy. It never changed. The church has always had moral laxity in it at periods of time. 
but it never has lost its doctrinal purity and teaching. Right, and the doctrines you see after the year 300, after Constantine, are the same before Constantine. They'll say, oh, but they invented infant baptism. Oh, really? In 313 AD? Well, actually, this booklet says in 416 AD, they invented infant baptism, even though Origen speaks of infant baptism in the year 248. Right. (laughs) Well, let's, let's look at the Bible, for example. If the Baptists were there, we would find we should find Baptists in the New Testament, if that was the religion. We never find the word Baptists in the New Testament anywhere. We find John the Baptist, but never does he have followers that continue on beyond the book of Acts. We do find in the book of Acts, chapter 19, when Paul comes to Ephesus, he finds some followers of John the Baptist. And they said they've been baptized, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit. And he says, into whose name have you been baptized? And they said, into John, meaning John the Baptist. And he said, oh, well, no, 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 no. We got to get this straightened out. We got to fix this. We're going to baptize you into Jesus, and then we'll get it straightened out. And John taught a baptism of repentance, but now we're teaching another baptism of Jesus, where you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And John the Baptist, when he was there, he he minimized himself. He had followers. Andrew and John the Apostle were originally disciples of John the Baptist. And they left to follow Jesus. And remember when John, I'm just dealing with this because they claim John is their founder. Right. So when when you when John is going to be beheaded, he tells his disciples to go up to Galilee and ask Jesus if, Jesus if he's really the one. Now is John doubting that Jesus is the one? No. He wants them to go up and find out from Jesus that he is the Messiah that John was talking about. He wants to wean them off of him and get his disciples all to go to Jesus, not to become little John the Baptists and take his name. So that John actually said, I must decrease, he must increase. So these believers in Ephesus had to get straightened around. Now, if you go to the Bible, you don't find anywhere where we see the name Baptists, nor do you in the first centuries. It's not heard of. But what we do find the name of the believers in the book of in the book of Acts, especially, is in the book of Acts, we see them referred to as the Nazareans, the sect of the Nazareans. A little bit later, they became known as the way, the way. Five times they're mentioned as this in the book of Acts. They refer to as the way. That's how Paul refers to them. Paul doesn't refer to them at first as Christians. Paul still thinks of himself as Jewish, by the way, but he refers to himself as the way and the Christians. Three times only the word Christian is used in the whole New Testament, only three times. In fact, Luke tells us that we were first called Christians in Antioch in Acts chapter 11, 26, which was decades after the death and resurrection of Christ. But we don't find Baptists, nor do we find them anywhere along the way. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to probably talk about later that um, about Baptist doctrines not being found in the early church as well. But uh, Steve, I'd like to shift gears a little, if you don't mind, and talk a little bit about the bloodshed, <laughs> so-called, okay. and the, the, their supposed uh, history um, of them, uh, ba- Baptists masquerading under different names through history. I mean, is that kind of their claim that they've always been around but existed under different names? Yeah, let's look at it this way. If they went underground and the Catholic Church is above the ground stomping them like like whack-a-mole, whenever (laughs) they come out, you whack them down and you keep them underground and you keep them oppressed. And so the Catholic Church is playing whack-a-mole with the real Baptists who are underground. And so what, what they have to do then in order to make this claim is they have to go... Uh, through history and dig these shafts down into the ground and see if what they find is Baptist. But they don't. But they dig a shaft and they see the Albigensians or the Cathari or the Paulicans or the and all of these different heresies, the Gnostics. The Gnostics are some of those. The Waldensians, they claim the Waldensias and their own. They, these were... Um, you know, uh, bef- just before the Reformation period of time. And they were heret- heretic sects that broke away. The Waldensians, who they say are theirs, look, at, I'm just going to read a list of what the Waldensians did believe in. And then you tell me if they can point back to the Waldensians as their ancestors. Okay. Real, be- Waldens- before you do, Steve, real quick, just yeah. to uh, clarify that 
Um, so basically, anyone who disagreed with the Catholic Church down yes. through history or yes. had a different point of view and were considered heretics were yes. actually, according to these fundamentalist Baptists, true Christians. No matter who they were, they were true Christians that the Catholic Church persecuted. So or they're they will, claiming that these people are Christians. Yes, or they will claim real Catholics. They like to think of Francis of Assisi as one of theirs. They will go to him and take some things of his writings out of context and say, see, he was one of us too. <laughs> he had some of the trappings of the cat, but Francis of Assisi was also one of us. We're, we have claimed to him because he said this or he said that or that. Maybe because he talks to animals. I don't know. But the uh, the successionists, the Waldensians, who they really look to as one of their own in, in like the genealogical tree, this is what they do. They try to go back and find their genealogical family tree. The Waldensians believe for the most part, in the perpetual virginity of marriage, the, the effectiveness of sacraments, infant baptism, the sacrifice of the mass of bread and wine, uh, the, and the faithful benefit the dead, just to name a few. The, the Waldensians claiming that these are their ancestors is not only disin, is ridiculous, but it's disingenuous. The Waldensians had nothing in common with the Baptists other than that they broke with the Catholic Church. So what you said a moment ago is absolutely true, that they would look to the groups that had broken and become a cult or a sect or a heresy, and they would find things in their the writings that they could relate to and say, see, there they are. There's our family tree moving through history. The fact is, is though, if a Baptist wants to go back, and I was saving this for the uh, ending for our conclusion, but we'll bring it up again anyway. When they try to go back and look for their genealogical tree, they run into a brick wall in the 16th century. Yeah, which is ironic since they say they've existed before the 16th century. And anyone who owns the Trail of Blood like I do, they have uh, they actually provide you with a map. It's like a diagram, and it shows you all like the Gnostics and then the Montanists and the Sibelius and all these different groups that have had a heresy in one way or the other. And they just assume that all these people are true Christians without even looking into what they actually yeah. believed. Um, one that of the chart is very ingenious. Let's give them credit. They're ingenious. <laughs> it's very good, actually. It's a very um, good chart. It is totally incorrect. If you take a look at those groups or those people they claim as their own, they're not anywhere near being Baptists. They're not even close. But like you said, they broke away from the Catholic Church, so they must be one of us. Yeah, and Steve. That chart is very clever. It's very ingenious. And a lot of people have fallen for it because it's very nicely laid out. It looks good until you look at it more carefully. Right. And uh, just years ago, just from my when I was first started looking at this and studying it, I uh, they had this whole group called the Paulicians. And it ha it, they take up quite a long part of that chart. And they're like, Paulicians were the true Christians. You know, we were they were Baptists, but we couldn't go by the name Baptist. So we were called Paulicians at that time. And so I decided to do some research on the Paulicians, and I found out that they actually believed in a good God and a bad God. They were Gnostic and dualistic. They rejected whole parts of the Old Testament in the Bible. And so I was thinking, like, these, <laughs> these are Baptists. They were literally trying to grasp onto any group that the Catholic Church said was heretical, even though they were heretical. I mean, even Baptists today, even fundamentalist Baptists today would consider them heretical because they believed in different gods and rejected parts of the Bible. So how could they claim that they were Baptists with any intellectual honesty? Well, it, it's it's a matter of desperation. It really is. If you're going to take, it's kind of like communists. Communists, if they wanted to claim they came from the first century, that Jesus started communism, well, they could say, well, they all had all things in common. They shared everything. They sold what they had and they all lived communally. Well, then we move into the early, and you could, you could make a chart like that to prove that Jesus really wanted to start Marxism, communism. And if you dig down deep enough, you could find quotes along the church about caring for the poor and so on. Say, see, Marxism goes all the way back to Jesus. He was the first Marxist communist. This is basically what they've done. Any group could do this, but it's not only dis it's totally disingenuous to do that. And it's historically completely inaccurate. It's, it's is, called anachronism. And anachronism is you, you see something today and you read it into the past. It's anachronistic. Mm. You read it into the past. And that's what these folks are doing. It's what are some other groups that they uh, claim were Christian or claim were Baptist that the Catholic Church persecuted? Do you know any off the top of your head? Um, 
I think maybe the Cathari or the Albigensians. Yeah, I have, a, I have a list of them here. Uh, the Cathari's, where did I put it here? I believe the Montanists were a, a group that they claimed uh, were actually They would claim Baptist. those. They would probably claim um, Marcion, who was an early breakaway, who only followed Paul. He rejected a lot of the New Testament books, only what was Pauline, the Book of Acts, the Waldensians, the Cathari's, the Albigenses, the Arnoldists, the Hen Henrichians, you mentioned the Paulicians. So yeah. all of these different sects are, and, and Gnostic groups as well. Yeah. The Gnostic groups that had, but they, they basically, but Gnostics didn't, they believed in a good God and a bad God, like you just suggested, and that there's a secret knowledge, but there's no way in the world that you could compare Baptists to the Gnostics, unless you're desperate. Right. And they are apparently, or just Very ignorant. Because one of these groups, I forget the name of the group, but one of the groups they actually said were Baptists and true Christians didn't even believe in a literal body of Jesus. They believed he was like a ghost or a phantom. Yes. And so it was like, right. That's how very the Gnostic. They're very much just grasping for straws. It's so unintellectual. I can't even take it seriously. And so for them to yeah. say that all Christians, anyone who wasn't a Catholic was a true Christian, basically, even though all of these people believed all different things, some of them rejected parts of the Bible. Some of them believed in the sacraments and infant baptism, things that uh, Baptists reject, um, but they believe Catholic things. So how could, it doesn't even make sense logically. No, it, it does if you want to believe it. If you're a parrot that has just learned to say what you've been taught to say, to mimic it, yeah, I, let me put my, myself back in those shoes. I was born and raised a Baptist. My dad had the trail of blood in our house. My dad believed it and he always talked about it. I even remember him mentioning the Waldensians and these guys. And I never researched that when I was a kid. Dad was smart. Dad taught me this. I believed it. When I got older and I, I never actually took the book and read it or did any research on it. I just assumed it was true. Like we began in the middle beginning, like it's a myth. I, I believe this mythical thing was true. I didn't ever challenge the fact that the early church went corrupt and apostatized. We just assumed that. It was something that we just assumed. And it wasn't until I really got saw the problems in Protestantism that I had to go back and I started to do my own genealogical roots. In fact, I did it with my family. I did our family history and I said, wow, I have a, I have a Christian history too. I'm going to go back and look at that more carefully and dove into the apostolic fathers and boy, you're going to get scared the bejeevers out of you. <laughs> where all of a sudden I have to be honest, where's my favorite uh, doctrines here? Where's my favorite uh, things going on? It wasn't there. So but I, I understand why they believe it. And if you are immersed in that, then, then it makes perfect sense to you. Um, I find it interesting that Baptists, uh, well, they claim a lot of things, but they actually say that the earliest Christians were Baptists and they give a lot of marks of the church. Like they'll yes. say things like there were the, the true marks of the church are this, that the church had no visible head that it was just an invisible body of believers. Uh, it didn't accept sacraments or baptism, um, infant baptism or doctrines like that. Um, it never merged church and state. And so they have a lot of these, I guess, fundamentalist Baptist uh, marks of the church. Are you familiar with those uh, at all? Yeah, and then they call them landmarks. And the first one is wrong, that the Bible... And one side of their mouth, they'll admit that the Bible wasn't collected and canonized till the end of the fourth century. And yet they hold to the fact that everything they know and they're based on the Bible alone. Well, the first four centuries didn't have that. How did the first century, second century know what to do? How did they know how to get saved? How did they know what kind of politics or policy that church should have? How did they know how to get baptized? They learned this from the very first Christians before there ever was a New Testament that was collected into a book. So if you're going to say that the number one landmark that they hold is that the by it's sola scriptura, they've got a real problem because the very first Christians didn't have sola scriptura. 
And they were, and then when you go back and you read the writings of the very first Christians, which this book will do for you, by the way, it'll give you all of this documentation that it was from the beginning. There was never an apostasy. And my book, Crossing the Tiber, also does that, especially in the areas of baptism and in the areas of the Eucharist, where I go through the writings of the early church and the New Testament. The fact is, it shows the lie to the trail of blood folks because the early Christians believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Ignatius of Antioch, 106 AD, he was one who probably learned this from the apostles or from one of their churches in that milieu of the New Testament of apostolic period. He's an old man at 107 or 106 AD when he dies in Rome and they take him from Antioch, which was the head of where we were first called Christians. And he was there when they were first called Christians. Some people say that he might have been the baby, the little child that Jesus put on his lap. That puts him contextually how close he was. And he says, beware of the heretics who refuse to partake of the Eucharist because they deny that it's the very body and blood of Jesus that hung on the cross. Now, what does a trail of blood person think of that where this first century Christian not a second century, he's a first century Christian, refers to the church as the Catholic church and a church that has bishops, priests, and deacons and that says the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and yet they don't even have the New Testament yet. They're saying, no, no, we can't come to our conclusion until we have the Bible because we're going to base everything on sola scriptura. So, but it's not there yet. This is the absurdity the total anachronistic absurdity of this position. And all it takes is a little homework to have it flushed right down the toilet. And what about their claim that there was no visible head in the church? And that was something that was invented long after Constantine, where they merged the church and state, supposedly. Well, we only have one head of the church. We'll agree with that. Jesus is the head of the church. The mystical body of Christ has a head. Jesus is the head. That's the whole book of Ephesians is about the body of Christ. The whole book of Colossians, which is the twin epistle, they were written together and they even read them, pass them back and forth. And uh, the, their twin epistles, Ephesians talks about the body of Christ. Colossians talks about the headship and supremacy of Christ. So we all agree we have one head to the church. But that is it, the, the, the mystical body. Jesus left leadership. That's why he gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter. What, what is this keys of the kingdom? What is it? Jesus is the king. The king had a royal steward. The royal steward carried the keys of the king. Isaiah 22, verse 22. This royal steward carries the keys, and what he opens, no man will shut, and what he shuts, no man will open. Ding, 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 ding. Do we hear anything more like this in the New Testament? Yes, the new king, Jesus, he owns the keys. And what does he do? He delegates them to his new prime minister because he He's going to go to prepare a place for us. And he's leaving his visible church here with a visible head. And he's given them the power to bind and loose. That was the authority of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Those words bind and loose, Jesus didn't make them up. They weren't said in a vacuum. They were said in the context of Jewish culture and civil and society. The rabbis, the scribes, the Pharisees, those in the head of the Jewish community had the authority to bind, which means to make laws, and to loose, which means to release from the laws. And he gave that authority to the new Sanhedrin, the new court, which is his apostles. There's leadership right there. They have authority over the people that are going to come after them. Paul goes out and he establishes churches and he doesn't just leave them. They have bishops put in their place. And the bishops, we learn, were to succeed one another. When one dies, another takes his place. We learn that from 60 AD from the writings of Clement of Rome, who was a convert of St. Peter. The apostles taught us this, that when they die, we are to pass on their sacred office through succession. This is a first century believer, the third bishop of Rome from Peter, who learned it from Peter. And so we see leadership in the church. Even the Baptist, for heaven's sakes, has a pastor and they have to follow their pastor. And if someone in the church sins or goes contrary, they will excommunicate him. 
Who has the authority to excommunicate him if Jesus is the only head of the church? Who are they to step into the place of Jesus and act as the head to make an action to excommunicate? See, they cannot keep consistent. They are full of hypocrisy. And there's no way that they can have any continuity or consistency with their teaching and the real world they live in. They have pastors. Many Baptists now even have Southern Baptist denomination. It's a whole denomination. And they have authorities there. And they can excommunicate and they can make decisions. They have a, th who's, what's this about Jesus being the only head? They have heads of theirs too. Sounds very Catholic to me. And uh, I think <clears throat> if uh, the Baptists looked back at the early church before Constantine, like you did, I think they would be very surprised to find out that all the earliest Christians, surprise, surprise, did not believe what Baptists believed. They believed that the church did have a head, that the church was built by Christ on the rock of Peter, who was given a primacy, who was given the keys of the kingdom, an authority over the other authorities. I mean, this is what the earliest Christians before Constantine talked about. So when exactly. Baptists and and Protestants say, oh, all of this changed at, with Constantine, but they've never done the research because you can find it all before Constantine. This is what Brian made me Catholic because I, when I was in this process, I couldn't have cared less about Constantine or what happened after him. I, I just had always assumed that him and then Gregory the Great and Leo, oh my goodness, they just established the papacy and they turned it into a dictatorship. I only cared about the very first Christians. And so... I was looking for a missing link, okay? So they, they talk about links too. They're looking back to see where their ancestry goes to follow the links, like that chart you showed, you know, all those red right. dots. They all the way go back. I wanted to go back and look at the same thing. My goal wasn't to find links. My goal was to find missing links. Because if I start out as an evangelical Protestant and I can find missing links, from the Catholic Church to what those early Christians taught, then I didn't have to become Catholic. I could have stayed happily an evangelical Protestant and wallowed around in the confusion that I knew was there and the problems, but I wouldn't. I looked for missing links. So for me, the only ones that were of a concern were the very first Christians, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, Irenaeus of Lyon, Justin Martyr, Clement of Rome, these guys that were there from the beginning. When I went back and studied them, I had a huge problem. It was like the Holy Spirit took my cage I was in and started to rattle my cage. What are you going to do now? Look at there's no missing links all the way back. They also, let's touch on this too, because we're talking about the Bible. They said that the Catholic Church burned the Bible and chained the Bible up so that real Christians could not get to the Bible. It was chained. And I remember when I was studying with Francis Schaeffer, Dr. Francis Schaeffer, Presbyterian minister and uh, intellectual guy in Switzerland when I lived there with him for six months. We went to a church in Olone and he showed me where the rood was, R-O-O-D. Here's where the podium was. And on the podium in the front was the Bible. But here was the rood screen, which kept, it was a block so that I could not get to the Bible. They were chained to the podiums to keep real believers to get to the Bible and find out you could really be saved by faith alone in the Bible alone. But why were those Bibles chained to the, why were they put behind a grating called a rood? Because a Bible was worth three years wages. We always assume we're anachronistic that it's always been, and we read about it. There was no paper. There were no printing presses. The only way you could have a Bible is to use the skins of animals called vellum or papyrus, which was plant, and it would decay in 30, 40 years. Then you had to hire someone like a monk for three years to handwrite the whole Bible out. The Bible was worth three years wages. In other words, it's a collector's item. Somebody gets their hand on that Bible, it's going to be sold on eBay real fast. So why did the Catholic Church chain them and put that so that the church would always have a Bible? It wasn't to keep we, us away from the Bible. It was so that the church would always have a Bible, just like the writings of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle were chained to the tables in the universities. And did the Catholic Church burn the Bible like they uh, these trail of blood folks say, yes, it burned it. And I should have thought to bring down, I have a green Bible upstairs. And this green Bible, I go to use bookstores. And whenever I see this green Bible, I buy as many copies of them as I can. And I come home and burn them in our fire pit out in the back. Steve Ray, 
That's a sacrilege. You burning the Bible? Yes, but look, I would say, look at the title. The Holy Scriptures of the Watchtower of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you read in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, and the word was, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. Now I ask you, Brian, is that the word of God or is it a heretical book? It's a heretical version. What should we do with it? Get Burn rid it. of it. <laughs> Burn it. The Catholic Church is the mother. She is in charge of the milk, the milk of the word that feeds her children. She can't have the milk go out with poison in it that's going to contaminate the children and poison them. She is in charge of giving them the pure word of God. So when these heretics came along, like Wycliffe and Tyndale, who even if they didn't have a heretical translation, had heretical notes in those Bibles, that nobody uses Tyndale and Wycliffe's Bible today. No. Nobody did. The Catholic Church burned them because she was in charge of keeping the pure word of God. And Martin Luther, they say he's the first one that got the Bible to the people in German. And not true, there were 18 editions of the Bible in German before he was ever born. Thank you to the Catholic Church. So that kind of deals with some of the misconceptions that these people have about the Bible. And I think I read a, I think I read a bishop who read Tyndale's Bible and saw 2,000 errors, more than 2,000 errors. <laughs> and as, at that point, it's not even the Bible anymore. It's a hack job. It can't even be called the Word of God. Same thing with the New World Translation of the Jehovah's yep. Witnesses. I mean, they changed every passage intentionally, which proves the divinity of Christ. And with their preconceived bias, they changed the word of God. So it's not even the word of God anymore. So you're actually burning the Bible and the word of God? No, you're you're burning a false uh, version of it. In and fact, these men, but, these men were not biblical scholars, not no. like the Catholic church who had people like Jerome and Aquinas. These were biblical scholars. The Catholic Church has preserved the accuracy and purity of the Word of God. These guys went off on their own, and they made heretical translations, very inaccurate translations as well, to the point, like you said, nobody even uses them today. <laughs> and um, so that, that takes care of that. One of the other issues is infant baptism, of course, which they reject. The Baptists love to say that the Bible says you must believe and be baptized, and the baby cannot believe. Therefore, you have to wait till they get beyond the age of accountability. And that was for me. I was four years old when my mother knelt with me and prayed in front of the green vinyl couch to accept Jesus as my Savior, pray the sinner's prayer. Of course, you got to remember that sinner's prayer, and you got to say it right. But uh, then again, there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer in the Bible either, is it? That's a man-made tradition. How old were you, Steve, when you did that? Four years old. My mom said, Stevie, you're old enough now to accept Jesus as your, as your own Savior because we've been teaching you about this. And do you know you're a sinner? Yes, I do, Mommy. Stevie, do you know that you would go to hell? Yes, Mommy, I know because I'm a sinner like you, like we know. Well, do you know that Jesus died on the cross? Yes, I do. And then they would go through the Romans road, which is the verses in the book yep. of Romans, that uh, Christ that died for us, even when we're yet sinners, he died for us. And the wages of sin is death. And all of these that go right through the Romans road, and that if I believe in him and confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus as Savior and Lord, I'll be saved. So we, she said, now we'll kneel down here and pray. And I knelt in front. I can still smell that green vinyl couch while I'm talking to you. And my brother confirmed this to me. My younger brother said, Steve, when I heard you say that, I remember that green vinyl couch. I remember that. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart that day, like Baptists do. But that prayer and that asking Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior is nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere does it say, I'll do a search right here. Right? I got my verb. Uh, personal Lord. Now it's not in the Bible anywhere. Or to ask Jesus into my heart. Okay, I'll do it. No, no. Not anywhere is there. Ask Jesus into my heart. So this is all man-made traditions, actually. But they can't be found in the early church. That's for sure. Now, infant baptism, like we were saying, that they say you have to believe first and be baptized. But we're talking about adult when they were speaking to people and I'm talking to you, Brian, you're not a Christian, you're a Jew and you need to be baptized. So you need to believe what I'm teaching you. And then we're going to baptize you. There's an assumption that the babies are going to go in with them because when a day of Pentecost came, Peter said, they said, how do we be saved? And Peter says, arise and be baptized, um, repent and be baptized. And it was for, the whole household. 
What would happen if they told the father of the Jewish family, oh, you got to put anybody over 13 out, under 13, under six. Well, oh, no, he's too young, too young. He would have said, wait a minute. You said this covenant was better, stronger, more powerful. It's a new covenant. The prophet you quoted in your homily here, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, you quote the prophet Joel, who said that this is for you and your children. And you're telling me now that my kids can't come into this? In Judaism, our kids come in at eight days old there, Peter. How come our kids can't come into this? And the early church understood, like Paul did in Colossians, that baptism replaces circumcision. Re baptism is the new circumcision for the Christian. And exactly. from the very beginning, Origen says, early second century, and, and Augustine and others do too, that this we have learned from the apostles. Right. That we are to baptize our old men, our young men, our women, our children, and even our infants to be born again through water baptism. This we have been taught by the, the apostles. And so, ironically, um, <clears throat> this upcoming Wednesday, um, next Wednesday, we're actually going to have a video on infant baptism. So we're going to go into this in great depth. We're going to quote the early fathers, show that it was long before Constantine and that myth, like you said, it's parroting. They repeat over and over, oh, God, infant baptism was invented with Constantine. It was invented with right. the Roman Empire. It's a paganism. But they never even think to look, well, is that true? Or did right. anyone teach it before that time? And everybody taught it before that and time. I Nobody condemned it. And one way we always do this, and I'm sure yours is going to be the same, is that we show the positive evidence of content which demonstrates that we practiced it. But exactly. think of the thundering silence of no one condemning it. Mm -hmm. If it was a heresy, if it was unbiblical, if it was unapostolic, the set first and second century would have stamped on that like a forest fire. There's a thundering silence that speaks almost louder than the words. Why does Irenaeus and Origen and Augustine and Ignatius and the Didache, why doesn't it say stop that infant baptism? You're not supposed to do that. They never do that. They only say that it's something that came from the apostles. Exactly. And also, we use sometimes the profound silence as a very strong argument. Exactly. Um I do, if you don't mind, I'd like to give some of the really um, funny, uh, comical aspects of this trail of blood. Um, I have a couple that I want to bring up. There are like literally probably hundreds. I mean, there's, there's so many errors on every page in this book. But one of my favorites that I just got a big laugh out of was that it says, um, during the fifth century at the fourth ecumenical council of Chalcedon, some people say Chalcedon, an entirely new doctrine was added called, quote, Mariology, or the worship of Mary. A new mediator seems to have been needed. The distance between God and man apparently was so great that it could not be fit for just one mediator, and so Mary was added. As, <laughs> I can't even finish it. Added as a mediator. Like, oh my gosh, I laughed out loud. So, but you uh, got to admit it's clever. It's clever to the way they state it because if you don't know your history, it's going to sound true. Because right. we Catholics refer to Mary as a mediatrix. So they can play right, they play right into the game as long as the people don't do any research. Right. I'm also a mediator because my dad came to me and he asked me to pray for him. I said, Dad, don't ever ask me to pray for you again. Because he said, when you become a Catholic, you're going to pray to Mary and call her a mediator. And you're going to pray to dead saints and call them mediators to get to Jesus and God. And I said, Dad, don't ever ask me to pray for you again. And he says, why? I said, because as soon as you ask me to pray for you, you put me in the middle. And a mediator means someone in the middle. You say, Steve, would you pray to God for me? And I say, okay, Dad. God, my dad here, I'm in the middle, of course. My, my dad would like you to bless him today. And my, we're all mediators, for heaven's sakes. It's but true. Jesus is the one mediator, which is a big cosmic kind of mediator, because you have a big chasm of sin and sinful man and a holy God, and there's no way we can get to him. It can only be brought about this way, and he puts a ladder across. It's called the cross. And Jesus is that big bridge, the cross, and he's there. He becomes the mediator between the 
sinful man. And he's the only one as God himself. Could he bridge that gap? He is the only mediator. I can't do that. You can't do that. Mary can't do that. None of the saints can do it. And all of us together can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. But once he does it, he says, now I want you to share in my mediatorship. I want you to share and I want you to pray for one another. And we'll do this together. See, that's a good thing. Exactly. I, I'll tell you, can, can I tell you a real quick story? Sure. I was asked by a priest and about eight Catholics to come uh, to a group in Michigan here. And the pa the guy named Dean had left the Catholic church and joined the Baptist church. And he had given him all of this stuff. And he used, he even said that he used the trail of blood as his historical source. And he wanted to debate with us. And so he said, I said, okay, how would you like to start the discussion? He said, I'll start the discussion by saying that we believe in the Bible alone and that salvation by faith alone. And you Catholics believe, and I know because I was an altar boy. That's what they all claim. You know, I'm an yeah. altar boy, so I'm an expert. <laughs> I just, I love it. I say, next, you're going to tell me you're an altar boy, right? Aha, see, you are an expert. But he said, and we believe in salvation by faith alone and not by all the rituals of the church. I said, okay, would you take your Bible for me and open it to first Peter chapter three, verse 21 and read that to me. He said, and the uh, Noah and the ark, they were saved through water and corresponding to that baptism now saves you. I said, is that the kind of ritual you're referring to? What Peter says here is that baptism now saves me, the ritual of baptism. Is that what you mean by we're not saved by rituals, but it looks like we are here? That guy shut up. He was I he was afraid. I said, you're afraid of your own book now, aren't you? Because I asked him to open and read another passage, and he said no. I said, you, got, you came in here with your pile of books and your Bible to use against me. I'm asking you simply to read from your own book, and now you won't do it. You're scared of it. You're afraid to open the Bible. <laughs> and at the end of that meeting, almost all of those, Catholic, those former Catholics came back into the Catholic Church. He was using the trail of blood as his historical source. Wow. Well, praise God for that. Um, it's just sad because like, if people don't know, it says they came up with a new doctrine at that council called Mariolatry. Yeah. <laughs> now I, ha I have all the council documents here. I've yeah. read them. There's no, there's nothing about that in the, the, the council doesn't even mention Mary. The council ironically is about Jesus and affirming the divinity of Christ and re reaffirming the divinity of Christ and, and other pastoral things as well. Like bishops can't sell their office. Bishops can't get elected by popularity. Like they didn't even deal with Mary at that council. It's like, you wonder, it's like, I've, I've realized I've been around long enough to realize that anti-Catholics don't actually do research. They study other anti-Catholics, but in the in the interim, they get some of the information wrong, but they write it down anyways. There's yeah. nothing in the council where it says, oh, and it was called Mariolatry. Like that's just not even a thing. And they um, don't put a footnote there to show you where to look it up. It's like the book by, by Bettner called Roman Catholicism. Which we have. And there's not a footnote in the book. He quotes, <laughs> he quotes all these things as supposed sources, but there's no footnotes and there's no way to document it. Most of them are wrong. I know we're almost out of time, correct? Yes. Okay. I, I would like to, if I can, yes. read just a passage from this book, who is a Baptist, writing about Baptist successionism or the trail of blood. Sure. And where did the Baptist really come from? This might be a good concluding paragraph from a yeah. Baptist. The evidence shows that Baptists originated out of the English separatism, certainly a part of the Protestant Reformation. Even if one assumes the Anabaptist influence, the Anabaptists themselves were a Reformation people. The tendency to deny that Baptists are Protestants grows out of a faulty view of history, namely that Baptist churches have existed in every century and thus antedate the Reformation. Baptists arose in the 17th century in Holland and England. They are Protestants. They are heirs of the Protestant reformers. This is written by two Baptists. That's very interesting because they even saw like modern day Baptists were started, they said in the book in 1569. I'm like, um, Baptists were started in 1609 by John Smith in Amsterdam. So with a Y, Smith with a Y. Correct. Correct. So they don't even have that right. 
It's like, it's really sad to me, Steve, that so many sincere people, and many people are sincere, Steve, that they really are looking for the truth. But then they yeah. come across books like this, yeah. uh, or Roman Catholicism, which is the godfather of anti-Catholicism, one of them. And um, they read these books and they think they're getting the truth. And I appreciate the fact that they're studying, but they don't then go fact check these things to see if they're true. They never look up a Catholic book to see, well, does the Catholic Church actually believe that? Or are these people just saying that the Catholic Church believes that? And so they never actually get the full truth unless, like yourself, you really start doing some deep, honest research outside of your pre-programmed, uh, I don't want to say brainwashing, but what you've been brought up with. And uh, okay. then you'd see something different, right? I can confirm that because I never read a Catholic book or a book by a Catholic until after I started this journey into the Catholic Church. I remember in 1982 and 83, when I moved to Switzerland and my wife and I with two kids in diapers and we studied with a reformed theologian, Dr. Francis Schaefer, I read 76 books that year. Wow. I had taken a lot with me and I borrowed them from their library. I read 76 books that year. Not one of them was from a Catholic source that I know of. I didn't read Catholic sources because why do you want to read that when you've got good evangelical Protestant stuff, right? I read all Protestant histories of the church, Protestant things. It wasn't until I, my father really initially got mad at me because he found out I was reading a Catholic book. And when I read the Catholic book and it let Catholicism speak for itself and not through the parroting voice of another, I found out that if you allow Catholicism to speak for itself, it speaks very eloquently. Do you remember what book you first read by chance? It might have been Catholicism and Fundamentalism by um, Carl, Carl Keating, Keating, or yeah. it could have been uh, yeah. Cardinal Newman's The, um, the, the uh, Development of Doctrine. Yeah, this is, uh, if anyone actually wants to know what the Catholic Church actually teaches, where it's found in the Bible, and why it's history, histor uh, why it's true history, and why it's true, definitely re pick up this book, and actually um, pick up uh, Steve Ray's book, too, Crossing the Tiber. You will never see so many Bible quotes in one book. So much history. Yep. Yeah, so many church fathers, so many Bible quotes. This is all the history and research that he did as a Protestant coming even long before he started thinking about Catholicism, he was researching these things and he realized that the early church was Catholic and so many people have come to the Catholic yeah. church once they've realized and in that. that book. That's my, that's the arguments for why I became Catholic. Um, I wrote that as originally as a letter to my father and it wasn't going to be a book. It was a letter to my dad, a Baptist deacon. And uh, But if anybody buys it from my website, I know you can buy them cheap on Amazon. I buy them on my website. It helps our family that hasn't had any work for a year because of this virus. And yeah. you get a signed copy. Yeah. And um, one more thing I just want to say to our audience, uh, another big book uh, that's led a lot of people to the Catholic Church is Surprised by Truth. Yep. And it's a story of uh, 15, 11 people, mostly anti-Catholics, who never, ever, ever, ever would have considered the Catholic Church to be true. But then something opened their eyes or they read something somewhere and it started them down that journey and now they're all Catholic. So they give their biblical and historical reasons for becoming Catholic. And it's they're very good. Yep, they're very good. It's you know, conversion stories are great because they reaffirm for Catholics what they believe. It's a reaffirmation. Uh, really good stuff. Well, thank you, Steve, for coming on our show today and sharing with us your, um, the Baptist history, which you actually shared yourself and subscribed to and believed in. And uh, yep. thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts, what you've learned, and your journey to Catholicism. And I just encourage people to follow the true trail of blood, which is the Catholic Church suffering through the centuries, too, because it has had uh, persecution left and right. And we are still the ship heading across the ocean, still battered by the waves of the world and the devil. But we're still on the ship and the ship is still sailing full steam towards the celestial city. So get on the real trail of blood, which is the Catholic Church. And uh be protected in that church and have the real successionism, the Catholic Christian successionism all the way back to the apostles. And I want to thank all of our listeners for listening and tuning in too and watching this video. And uh, check out our show notes below. I'm going to link uh, the blog of the Succession of Baptists, The Trail of Blood, Steve Ray's blog on it below, along with his website and a couple of his books. And uh, also check out our um, our 
Catholic Truth Podcast, our Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and uh, check out all of those notes below. We are going to give you some good resource materials. And of course, if you have any questions, you can message us down below, or I'm sure you can message Steve on his site. But we are here for you to help accompany you on your journey, whether you are Catholic or not, whether you are just starting out or an expert, we are here for you. So if you have any questions, comments, or anything, put them in the comments below. We will be praying for you, and we ask you to pray for us. God bless you all.